Welcome to the 2021 Monday Thursday service for Tomiswing Deanery. This is the day that Christ, the Lamb of God, gave himself in the hands of those who would slay him. This is the day that Christ gathered with his disciples in the upper room. This is the day that Christ took a towel and washed the disciples' feet, giving us an example that we should do to others as he has done to us. This is the day that Christ our God gave us this holy feast, that we who eat this bread and drink this cup may here proclaim his holy sacrifice and be partakers of his resurrection, and at the last day may reign with him in heaven. Let us pray. O God, your Son Jesus Christ has left to us this meal of bread and wine, which we share his body and his blood. May we who celebrate the sign of his great love show in our lives the fruits of his redemption. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Reading from Exodus chapter 24, verses 3 to 8. When Moses went and told the people all the Lord's words and laws, they responded with one voice. Everything the Lord has said we will do. Moses then wrote down everything the Lord had said. He got up early the next morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain and set up 12 stone pillars representing the 12 tribes of Israel. 
Then he sent young Israelite men, and they offered burnt offerings and sacrificed young bulls as fellowship offerings to the Lord. Moses took half of the blood and put it in bowls, and the other half he splashed against the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it to the people. They responded, we will do everything the Lord has said. We will obey. Moses then took the blood, sprinkled it on the people and said, this is the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This is the reading from Psalm 116, verses 10 to 17. How shall I repay the Lord for all the good things he has done for me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his servants. O Lord, I am your servant. I am your servant and the child of your handmaid. You have freed me from my bonds. I will offer you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and call upon the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. In the courts of the Lord's house, in the midst of you, O Jerusalem, hallelujah. Eternal God, faithful in your tender compassion, you give us hope for all our life here and hereafter through the victory of your only Son. When we share his cup of salvation, revive in us the joy of this everlasting gift. We ask this in his name. Amen. Reading from the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 23 to 26. And so, while the Jews demand miracles and the Greeks look for wisdom, here are we preaching a crucified Christ to the Jews, an obstacle that they cannot get over, to the pagans, madness, but to those who have been called, whether they are Jews or Greeks, a Christ who is the power and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom. And God's weakness is stronger than human strength. The word of the Lord. A reading from the Gospel according to St. John. Just before the Passover feast, Jesus knew that his time had come to depart from this world to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he now loved them to the very end. The evening meal was in progress. And the devil had already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, that he should betray Jesus. Because Jesus knew that the Father had handed all things over to him, and that he had come from God and was going back to God, he got up from the meal, removed his outer clothes, took a towel, and tied it around himself. He poured water into the wash basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to dry them with the towel he had wrapped around himself. Then he came to Simon Peter. Peter said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not understand what I am doing now, but you will understand after these things. Peter said to him, you will never wash my feet. Jesus replied, if I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, Wash not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. Jesus replied, The one who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you disciples are clean, but not every one of you. For Jesus knew the one who was going to betray him. For this reason he said, Not every one of you is clean. So when Jesus had washed their feet and put his outer clothing back on, he took his place at the table again and said to them, Do you understand what I have done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and do so correctly, for that is what I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you too ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example. You should do just as I have done for you. 
the gospel of Christ. I speak to you in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We have a very intimate scene before us tonight. Jesus is with his closest friends, his closest disciples, together in an upper room in the evening amid the celebration of the Passover supper. They are together as master and disciple, also as friends. Then amid this very traditional meal, Jesus does something that is not at all traditional. He rises, removes his outer clothing, and washes the feet of his disciples. This is a story we have probably heard many times before. Perhaps we've had our own feet washed or done the washing in a service on Maundy Thursday that recreates this action by Jesus. Often we think of it and speak of it as Jesus showing humility or teaching his disciples humility. Indeed it is, but we need to remember that it has a much larger meaning than that. This is not just an example or an illustration of a value called humility, which we can define apart from Jesus. This is a particular humility of Jesus, which does something, as he himself will say, and which is also a sign. It's not just an exercise to imitate. The foot washing fits into a whole scene in that upper room, whose windows open into the largest view, a view of all that is and is to come. That's quite in keeping with John's way of telling Jesus' story. He is not just relating what happened. St. John is constantly telling us what it means. It is always in a bigger frame. And here, the bigger frame comes in pieces of knowledge. Jesus knew that his time had come to depart. He knew that Judas would betray him. And he knew that the Father had handed all things over to him. That coming betray betrayal by Je Judas hangs over this scene in a way we don't often appreciate. And immediately after the part we've just heard, the story turns altogether to that. So that this is a much bigger part of the Maundy Thursday picture than we often appreciate. Yet we have no indication that Jesus treated Judas any differently in the foot washing. He washed the feet of his betrayer along with all the others. What he says to them all is addressed to Judas too. Whatever he intends to show by this action is for Judas too. He loved them to the end, St. John says, and that included Judas. Jesus knows that one of his own is going to turn him over to be humiliated tortured and painfully put to death. When he gets up and removes his outer garments, this is not just a practical action to keep them from getting wet or dirty, nor does, is it a simple gesture of humility. It is a sign pointing toward the stripping that will be an important part of his passion to come. Not a judicious, modest self-lowering, but a submission to total humiliation and ridicule. That is what he is to take on before he submits completely to the power of death. Now, for anyone to wash the feet of their friends would be a humble, self-lowering action. But the special meaning of this foot washing comes because of who Jesus is to begin with. To the disciples, he is their rabbi, their teacher, also their Lord, however hazily they sometimes understand that. Peter shows this in his protests against Jesus washing his feet. And Jesus, although taking the part of a servant, retains control. He tells Peter what he will and will not do, and not on Peter's conditions, but according to his own plan. If I do not wash you, you have no share with me. When he is finished, he returns to his place at the table, and he affirms it. You call me teacher and Lord, and do so correctly, for that is what I am. Jesus has not lost anything through this act, any more than he will lose anything through the coming events it points to. Quite the contrary. Jesus is not only teacher, not only even Lord. 
He is the one who knows the Father has handed all things over to him. And here we are looking out the window into eternity, into the biggest scale we can imagine, to see the Alpha and the Omega. Jesus will indeed be stripped, stripped of all worldly protection and status. He will take the form of a slave in the manner of his death, the most degrading death that even the creative Roman authorities could devise. And yet, through that death and resurrection, he will break the power of death to resume his rightful place as the Lord of all, just as he came back to his place in the upper room. He will judge, he will defeat evil forever, he will reign over a new heaven and a new earth. The Father has handed all things over to him. The foot washing as a sign shows not only that Jesus is humiliated in order to be glorified, it also shows in the nearer view that it is not just humiliation for the sake of humiliation, but the coming horrors are in the service of something else, which is Jesus's love for his own. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you too ought to wash one another's feet. You should do just as I have done for you. Indeed. Yet what Jesus has done is a sign of his total self-sacrifice. To do just as he has done is a taller order even than we may at first think. It's a bit like the poor widow in the temple. The rich, putting their large donations into the charity chest, were giving what they thought they could spare. And that is often the way with our self-conscious humility, too. We lower ourselves as far as we are willing to go, without actually giving up anything we really hold dear. But the poor widow's gift, although minuscule as an amount, was immense in meaning because it was, according to Jesus, all she had. The wonder of Jesus washing his disciples' feet is that while remaining completely himself, teacher and Lord, he also foretells his giving up everything that counts in this world. Do we understand what he has done? It is a subject Jesus raises right there in the upper room, not once, but twice. He says to Peter directly that he does not understand, but he will later. Then he asks the whole group, do you understand what I have done? If you look at that verse in different Bibles, you will find that about half of them render it, do you understand what I have done for you? And about half of them, do you understand what I have done to you? Which seem to mean two different things. There's a good reason for this. In English, we need two different words to make that sentence work. In Greek, there is only one, and it could mean either, or it could mean both at the same time. To me, this is deeply meaningful. It suggests that in doing something for his own, washing their feet, becoming their servant, Jesus has also done something to them changed them. We are probably more accustomed to thinking of what Jesus has done for us, his self-sacrifice wiping out the guilt for our sin. Do we adequately understand that he has also done something to us, that we are different people than we would have been without knowing him? Some of us can say confidently, yes, we sense or feel that change. Others may be less sure, our transformation is not so vivid or so literally felt. We may not actually adequately understand who we are as we. When Jesus asks his question, do you understand what I have done? He does not mean each of you as individuals. He means you as a body, a body that includes Judas. What he has done for the body to the body includes Judas. 
It is in that body that Peter and everyone will at last understand. When St. John affirms in telling the upper room story that the Father had handed all things over to Jesus, he is restating something he said much earlier. For the one whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for he does not give the Spirit sparingly. The Father loves the Son and has placed all things under his authority. He does not give the Spirit sparingly. That Spirit poured out on the believers by the one to whom the Father has handed all things over will be what creates the church. And within the church, we understand. In the body of the church, we understand what Jesus has done for and to us. Because it is in the body of the church that we most fully grasp what it means to wash one another's feet. That church of Pentecost was one in which Judas the betrayer had been replaced by another apostle. Yet she has counted within her midst other Judases, others who have betrayed their Lord, from that time to this, including, at some time or another, in some way, great or small, every one of us. The amazing thing is that this does not change Jesus' love for his church, a love to the end. What he has done to us in the church is to justify us, to set us right, Judas's and all. Whether we realize it or not, that is the other amazing thing. If our answer to the question, do you understand what I have done to you, is not exactly, that's actually all right. It has happened anyway. It's not a feeling. It's a reality. In the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Sister, let me be your servant. Let me be as Christ to you. Grant all the name of the grace. Let you be my servant too. We are pilgrims on a journey. Father God, as we approach this sacred space of prayer, 
May we first take a moment to settle ourselves, clearing our minds of the tasks, situations, and circumstances of the day. Our to-do lists, things pressing into our mind, heaviness in our hearts, and all matters that press in on our time. And just breathe. Breathe in deeply and exhale all the stuff. Breathe in the quiet peace, calmness, and comfort of God, and breathe out all the clutter. Just breathe. Lord, in this silence, taking this opportunity of prayer, which simply means a conversation with you, where we take turns speaking and then listening in this two-way conversation. Whatever your background, churched or unchurched, curiosity or deep faith in God, we pray together now. He is listening, he is waiting to join with us in this intimate conversation of the heart. The response to Lord in your mercy will be hear our prayer. Lord, we thank you for the coming of spring. We thank you for a new season. We thank you to be freed of the grips of winter, the coldness. We look forward to new growth, plants of all kinds and colors. We look forward to the warmth of the sunshine on our skin, for being outdoors, embracing all that you have to offer in your creation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for peace throughout the world, for restoration of global health, for vaccines to combat and protect us from this virus. We pray for all medical staff, lab technicians, volunteers, emergency responders, doctors, nurses, frontline workers, we pray for everyone who's been affected by COVID. We pray for families who've been unable to see each other, to hug each other. We pray for all who've lost loved ones, friends, families, co-workers during this pandemic time. Lord, we pray for your comfort to surround them as they grieve. As we are all unable to gather as we usually would to share love and support, we pray for all those left behind praying for the hope of being reunited once again in our heavenly home. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for students and teachers at all academic levels. We pray for your wisdom and strength as new ideas and ways of delivering information are used. We're thankful for technology to help facilitate this new way of teaching. We pray for those who are struggling with these new methods. We pray that teachers will feel valued and students will feel heard as they ask for help. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all levels of government, locally and globally, that are working tirelessly to try to keep communities safe, for those who are ignoring guidelines and recommendations. These are unprecedented times where difficult decisions are being made around the clock. We pray for grace in our communities as protocols are made and changed and as programs are created to help those in greatest need, to help people and our economy. Lord, only you know the big picture. Help us to keep our eyes focused on you and not completely enveloped by fear. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, help us to never forget and take for granted the fragility of this earthly life. Remind us to follow Jesus' example and speak love in the world. Help us to be a light in the darkness, to strive for peace, to care for others, to show compassion and extend forgiveness. We are all suffering in one way or another, perhaps grieving loss of family gatherings, missing celebrations, birthdays, Christmas, Thanksgiving, celebrations like graduations, weddings, anniversaries, Help us to all be present in the moment that we're in, this moment right now, and to find things to be grateful for. Help us to be reflective in checking on our own spiritual health, especially now when our calendars may not be as full. Help us to grow in this pandemic, open our eyes, 
Help us to look outwardly, too. Perhaps try something new. Where do we see a need? How can we help? Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those who are struggling in these times of isolation, for those with depression, job loss, food insecurity, and uncertainty all around us right now. Lord, help us to trust that you will provide for our very deepest needs. We may be missing hugs and close contact with family and hanging out socially with friends because we were made to be in community. We're thankful for technology where we can gather and help fill this need. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all churches and clergy in our deanery. We know that they struggle too to stay connected with their parishioners, feed their flocks with the word of life, which is the Bible. We thank you for online services being provided and for all who are participating in them. We thank you for lay readers, musicians, and those videoing the service, for those making the content accessible as well. We thank you for the hours of preparation going into this kingdom work. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And for what else do we pray? Speak it out loud if you feel moved to do so, or quietly in your heart. God is listening. He invites you into a conversation. Lord, as we move ever closer to the cross, and your sacrifice and suffering it brought you on our behalf. May we be thankful and humble and in awe of such love to give your life in our place. May we contemplate the gift of that sacrifice and what it means to each one of us. May we never ever forget the weight you carried, the humiliation and pain you suffered, and the isolation of that moment. That sacrifice that brought our freedom, the hope of eternal life through the glorious resurrection of Easter Sunday. We thank you for the cross that made a way for us to speak directly with you today in this moment. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We trust you now, Jesus, to answer these prayers and requests in your timing and as may be best for us. And in your precious name we pray. Amen. And now as Christ has taught us, we will to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. With the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you this day and forevermore. The filming, the stripping of the altar in the various parishes now follows.